Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I'll give a few moments for people to get logged in and things like that. Uh, welcome, welcome. I can already see a few people in. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. I'll give one extra moment before we get started. Oh, that's perfect. Look, the cat has just decided to relax there on the shelf. Can you see? Perfect. So that's a very aesthetic choice she just made there for us. So that's good. Okay. Well, that's a minute. So let's get started, shall we? Oh, thank you, Scene Spaces. I love you too. Um, right. Shall we, on that lovely note then of love, let us uh, get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And this is the first episode of One Artist, One Artwork. The idea of this series is to take a single piece of art and one artist on the journey and look in depth at that piece of art. For those who don't know me, my name is Dan Curtis, uh, also known as Odd Jobs. I'm an artist, I'm a curator and a writer from London in the UK. And seeing as this is the first one and some of you will be uh, seeing this for the first time, I'll give you a little bit of background and about what, what this is about for me and what I hope you'll get out of it and how it started. So um, last year I was running a series called One Thought, One Artwork. It was a short video series um, where I was doing these sort of mini two minute deep dives into artists' work. Um, the idea being trying to give a space in the hectic nature of the timeline for people to have a moment to really engage with something. The irony was that um, I was having to make them so short so that people would actually watch them all the way through. And um, I found that the timeline itself was uh, still too, too fast a place for me to be able to put that kind of content. So I thought, what if instead of doing it as a video, I actually, you know, did it live like this as a discussion and not just me, but bringing the artist along too. Um, so that's where the idea of what artist, one artwork has been. Um, I, I, bought, I bought myself a mic for it, a new mic. So now I look like one of those um, sort of like white male podcast guys. Um, and, and with that in mind, um, I'm going to really take that identity on and I'm just basically going to talk about the most mundane things that have ever happened to me as if they're like the most profound experiences. No, no, I won't. I won't do that. <laughs> don't worry. I'll just do conspiracy theories instead. No, no, wait, don't worry. Hopefully it'll be better than that. But I want to encourage in this space now a time of what I call slow looking. So let me explain that a little bit. So when it comes to viewing art, there's all sorts of things that get in the way of our engagement with it. Um, and the reason I want to encourage this idea of slow looking here, particularly in the digital art space, is that I think there's two issues when it comes to looking at art just on our social media feeds or or um, uh, in a digital space. And I think the two issues are the issue of speed primarily and then the issue of consumption. Um, on the speed side of things, as you know, our social media space, Twitter space, where a lot of us coming from today is so fast paced. And it's actually, it, you could try and slow yourself down, but actually it's not often possible to slow yourself down and look at work in depth. And that way, a lot of quite subtle artwork gets lost in the process. Um, and uh, a lot of artwork that's very shouty and loud is sort of competing for attention to try and get you to look at it. And that's a kind of a bit of a distorted way of looking at art, I think. Then the issue of consumption. I think sometimes social media gets us to see art as a form of consumption rather than a form of experience. And by that, I mean with the advent of scroll, uh, scrolling technology, 
there can be this sense that there is just ne it's just never ending uh, artwork. But also scrolling technology makes us feel like we've got to get to the end of the artwork. We've got to see everything. And it's really fatiguing. Um, and I think it then translates into the gallery space as well. And we end up going to galleries and we're sort of, we're trying to like, uh, let's say we go to the the MoMA or the Tate Britain, we're trying to do the Tate Britain, we're trying to look at absolutely everything. And in the end, we're looking at nothing and we're just leaving sometimes sort of angry and frustrated. So what I want to create here with this series is a kind of guilt-free, welcoming, non-scrolling space in which we can come together and really spend time looking at something. And uh, it's not like getting a whole idea of one artist's whole career and all the work that they do, just focusing on one artwork, giving it the time it really needs, and hopefully encouraging us to take that idea of slow looking out into the rest of your art engagement. So that's one artist, one artwork. I thought I'd give it that little introduction, seeing as it's the first one. Um, this series is really uh, beautifully and wonderfully sponsored by um, uh, two groups of people that I need to talk about. The first is Collector. They're a really amazing platform for showing and collecting art. Um, if you, uh, you'll see either at the end or you can do it during this, although we will be looking at the artwork obviously on screen here. Um, there you can see the artwork on the collector platform and it will be available to uh, for sale after the spaces which I'll talk uh, after this uh, interview sorry which I'll talk a little bit about at the end and really big thanks to collector for uh, you know boosting us and giving us the platform to create an archive um, of sorts because after each interview they'll be uploaded to Collector. So you'll be able to come back um, in a few months time and see all the interviews and all the artworks together. I also want to give a big shout out to Damzine. They are a fantastic digital art zine um, who support artists from all different backgrounds working in all different media. They are uh, supporting me as I make this series. And at the end of the first set of this series, when I've done uh, between eight and 10 interviews, they are going to uh, publish a uh, collection of all the works together in one uh, edition of the of the zine. So I'm really excited for that. So with that being said, today we're going to be interviewing and looking at a piece by the amazing Tony Wallstrom. He is our first guest. He is a physical and digital abstract artist from Sweden. Um, and uh, by that, I mean, um, that his work is a mixture of physical and digital. He himself is not a mixture of physical. He is not a physical digital artist from Sweden is what I mean. Well, I, he doesn't like sort of, you know, um, switch between physical and digital forms. Uh, well, actually saying that I've, um, I have actually never met him. I've only ever done talks like this. So he might, he might be purely digital. <laughs> he might be AI. This might be turning into like a deeper conversation than I ever ima imagined possible. Um, uh, hope I'm going to say hopefully he's not AI, but that made me sound like a kind of AI hater. I'm sort of like caught in a paradox. OK, anyway, what I mean is he uh, makes uh, physical artworks and digital artworks as well, and sometimes a combination of the two. Um, and today we're going to look at a uh, new piece um, by Tony in one of his new series. And part one, we're going to do that deep dive. I'll chat with Tony about the work. We'll look at the work in detail. And then in second half, I'm going to hand over to you guys for questions, the guys in the audience. And so when I uh, ask you um, about that, you'll be able to drop your uh, comments in the YouTube uh, YouTube stream. I, I can see them already coming through. So thanks for that. And when it gets to questions time, just drop your questions. Depending on how many there are, we'll, we'll do as many as we can. And I can bring them up on screen here. Okay, so Tony Wallstrom. Let me just get this up for you here. So you'll often find uh, Tony in the studio uh, making these beautiful large scale abstract works. Um, he works in a lot of different medium in the physical studio as well. He's recently been working on this uh, series called uh, Purple Paintings, and you can see some of the progress of those here. They're quite interesting. We might talk a little bit about them as the piece we're looking at today comes off the back of these works as well. 
and they are made using variety of uh, materials and a variety of paints and, and paint dyes and things like that. Quite interesting process. Um, yeah, really, really beautiful works and quite bodily, quite gestural. Um, here's one of the stained pieces as well, which is really nice. He also makes these digital physical hybrids, as I was just saying, where um, uh, some are taken from uh, fragments of information from real paintings, training AI to understand his work and developing into these beautiful, glitchy, abstract pieces um, that end up even with the sort of uh, the, the harshness of sometimes flipping between digital and physical, these very beautiful and um, sensuous landscapes almost. Um, and this was from another digital series uh, where the kind of elements are all breaking down, really beautiful. So the piece we're gonna be talking about today is from this new series. And um, before I jump in and show you the piece, I'm gonna bring up the amazing Tony Wallstrom. So here he comes. Hello, Tony, can you hear us? Are you there? Yes, yes, yes. I could hear everything. It, uh, I'm actually not AI. I'm. I can reassure. I can <laughs> assure you about thing. that. That's the first thing an AI would say, isn't it? I'm not. Yeah. AI. Actually, no. The yeah, first exactly. thing an AI would say was, "I'm afraid I don't have emotions." Blah blah blah. Don't yeah. they? So, yeah. Maybe you. Yeah. Maybe you're right. Maybe you are physical. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but so uh, good to see you. you. How is everything over in Sweden at the moment? Are you in the studio right now? Yes, I am. I have most of my, you know, like I also have a microphone, so I'm in the club. Uh, <laughs> Great. <laughs> the, white, uh, the White Guy Podcast Club. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We're making yeah. it happen. Yes. No, but I have my screen here and I have all my, like the office uh, essentially here. So, yeah, that's great. I, I like to be here. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So before we get into showing the audience a new piece and um, what you've been working on, I'd love to just get a little bit of introduction to you, your sort of background, your practice. Um, mm -hmm. You're primarily an abstract uh, artist, um, although we'll discuss in some of these new works today where there's some interesting plays on that. But how did you find yourself in the world of abstraction and making abstract art and what drew you to it in the first place? I think, well, I, I guess, like, I would like to say that I kind of sucked at, uh, you know, like, painting in general. I was not really good good at that in terms yeah. of, you know, like, uh, making something look like it should be looking. And um, <clears throat> I've only really been painting for a few years now. So so when I first started off, I, I guess the first thing you start to look for is, like, a landscape or something that you could actually um you know like that, that you've seen or that you like the, something common i guess uh live on the countryside so it kind of makes sense to draw something from that um and then i realized like i said you know i i i pretty much suck at it or maybe not suck at it but i'm more um uh i put too much um you know like I think I put too much effort into it for it to look a specific way. And then when it didn't turn out that way, you know, it's like, I mean, like, why did I do that? And then um, I guess it sort of just crept up on, on me after a while, um, you know, like just not giving shit about how it's looking, but rather trying to convey something within it, like convey the colors of a landscape, for instance. Mm or uh, or like an emotion which is kind of hard to uh, to uh, to even uh, visualize sometimes and i think that's that's where abstraction sort of uh does a really good job i guess and um and then obviously i got i nerded out on it uh, tried to learn as much as i could and um, started going up larger in scale in in, in terms of canvases uh, trying different techniques, mediums, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it just sort of like happened gradually, but in a quite, quite a, quite a fast pace, I would say. That's really interesting. And uh, it's interesting what you're saying there about how, yeah, how difficult it is to describe what abstraction does. I think that's part of its beauty, isn't it? In that it yeah. seems to translate into form something about our 
deep emotional mm -hmm. experience. But at the same time, it's almost impossible to describe because it's so slippery and elusive in terms of yeah. uh, what it's doing. Yeah. Um, what are you focusing on in the studio at the moment and on the computer, I guess? Well, primarily right now, I'm I'm working on this uh, series called the Pearl Purple Paintings or the Purple Works. I can't remember what I did call it, uh, but th that's been my most recent, uh, I guess, like my most recent project or something that I intend to hopefully extend into more than just uh, large scale abstracts, uh, looking into more mediums to explore so it's it's been a lot of exploration i think it's just boiled down from a lot of other things that i've done been doing before uh, or tried out um and it's just coming back and uh, i'm just trying to apply it as as i move along and not trying to sort of like limit myself in terms of uh formats mediums um if it's analog or digital or uh or anything like that so i hope to you know like maybe do that for a while i guess i mean like eventually you'll grow tired of it and maybe then i'll sunset it but for now i kind of i'm kind of looking forward to uh, adding more more and more to it as we go along and i think i've just released i think it's 14 or uh, 15 pieces um in total so we'll see i mean it's it's already a pretty large collection in my on, uh, like looking at what what i've done before but um yeah so that's going to be that's what i'm doing right now and that's what i hope to uh, be doing uh as the year goes uh goes on i guess amazing yeah and that's uh yeah we'll talk more about purple i think as we yeah into this piece but um yeah i'm sure we're all excited to see exactly what we're going to be looking at today so let's do that so this is the new series and we're going to be looking at this piece today so this is our one artwork today this is called 15 is that right number 15 or 015 yeah yeah and... so it's the 15 piece in in that sort of purple works uh, yeah i, I tried to yeah. just label them or like number them rather. Fantastic. And it's part of a series called Cupboard Universe. Is that right? Which I uh, I really, really love. Um, yes. I won't rush into uh, questions. I'll just sort of give a audience a chance to have a look over this piece um, and check every corner and left and right and see every little detail and i will bring up some close-ups in a minute because there's a lot of interesting details here but what might be nice as a way of starting looking at this one piece is how did this series start to me from what i've shown prior just to this there is a little bit of a difference in terms of we're obviously not just looking at a straight uh, oils on canvas but we're obviously also not just looking at something that's a uh, glitched fragments um so yeah this seems fairly fresh for you and how did it start yeah i think it started i, I mean obviously there's a lot of discarded materials um involved in my in my practice at least you know if i stretch a canvas um some of it just like is being discarded or you know like trimming the edges of it or um i usually work on the floor just roll out uh, a big piece of canvas uh work on the floor and then you know like decide where i want to uh where i want to position the frame and then you know like there's a lot of things outside of that that you know like literally gets thrown away so, so and and sometimes for me at least i guess the more i move around it because it's usually just lying around the floor anyways the the discarded materials um i i i usually either i use it as sort of like scraping off paint on uh or trying out marks before i i'm applying it to the to the main sort of like stretched piece and then i started looking more and more at them because i was spending more time you know trying out things and doing things on those discarded pieces and then it's like i mean this is kind of looking cool because i didn't really think of what i did on them if that mm, makes sense yeah um and uh found interesting 
marks and just accidents or coincidences that occurred on these papers on a, on these uh, uh, canvas cotton canvas linen canvas um and just you know like started t dissecting them so to speak like digitally both digitally scanning them and you know like bringing in the pieces that i thought was interesting and also just you know like scissors essentially or knives mm -hmm. just to to get it out um and the saving them in 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 a like i have a box it's like no good order at all i have a lot of junk in my in my space <laughs> here um as every artist does yeah 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 so but but it's it's sort of like a, it's becoming more of more of a library where i can go back and say like oh where i could use this and it, i i usually tend to remember it's almost like a journal mm. um it's like if you're if you write something down it'll be easier for you to to remember it later on just by writing it down essentially it's like you're putting it away and i can relate to where i was at that like not not exactly where I was, but what in what um, uh, in what artwork I was working on at the time it right, belonged right. to, or or um, why it came about, and uh, and all of that. So it's quite interesting. And I figured, you know, like I just want to, I I should probably use this, and I have used this in terms of uh, when I worked with uh, AI, sort of, uh, you know, like getting the fragments from. Uh, the AI outputs that were basically fed by my uh, pictures of my paintings. So, sort of the same. So this was more of an analog take on it, I guess. Um, mm. That's super interesting. And I love that idea of, yeah, almost like a sort of diary entry. And it yeah. and it's interesting because the, what strikes me immediately as I saw this piece, again, I don't want to just compare it to your other work, but... Um, in the sense that a lot of those canvases are, are, are very large or even the AI uh, digital, pure digital pieces have this sense of quite expansive space. Um, I it's, it was starting to describe it as almost like a landscape, whereas here you've dropped us into something extremely intimate. It feels like it feels handheld. It feels like there's things that are that I recognize that I could that I could touch the the gesture the large gesture isn't there but at the same time it's it's a little bit deceptive and i think we'll get into that as well because of course you we might look at this and think that it's a very small area of uh, just one piece of canvas but as we get closer we'll see fragments of all different scales coming in so maybe i'll um let actually let me uh go to the next slide so we can close up so maybe if we come to the bottom left down here that might be a good idea my cat wants to say hello come on darling <laughs> i knew she would get too excited hi everyone if this isn't going to make the um this successful this series then i don't know what is <laughs> hi <laughs> right go on darling off you go um yeah let's go down to this bottom left corner here um and there's some little things that start to speak to us so i think primarily first it'd be great for you to speak to us about uh image the imagery that's uh, yes. obviously brought up here this feels like uh to me as reading it as a, a fragment from an old book or a magazine it looks to me like a picture of um slides as it seems like something like that um yeah. and yeah could you just um speak a little bit about this because i guess from from my perspective two questions one is it's interesting that you're like wh how, how have you come to use this is it that same process where you're just finding it on the floor or was it more into to uh, intentionally sought after and secondly th this isn't as clearly abstract we're obviously working with imagery although the imagery is kind of taken from its context and abstracted in some way I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts around that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it was something that I had lying around for sure. Yeah. Uh, not just on the floor because it, it was a book that I purchased years, years back. And it's, uh, it was about um, conserving food, essentially. So <laughs> right. an, old, an, old, an old book about conserving food. And they, I thought, always thought they had uh, these interesting um, 
it's like obviously it's old old school photos uh black and white um and just hands and tools and how you should you know like store your preserved or conserved food essentially <laughs> <laughs> and um and i i already had thought of uh, calling these uh, i think it's three pieces that are called sort of like the sub like a sub series of the purple works that are called uh, this is the third uh, uh, the cupboard universe mm. um and it kind of made sense when i saw them it's like oh the, this this is why i bought this book like five six years ago you know like this is this this is why right. i should have had it you know <laughs> like this this is the purpose of it, <laughs> it i'm came not gonna to be purpose, conserving yeah. food anymore you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's really yeah. interesting i think yeah for me as well it starts to then play with oh, okay, I'm not quite sure what I'm looking at here. What I thought I understood immediately is now started to be uh, disrupted a bit. And then just behind that little bit of what seems like a fragment of canvas, there's a tiny little yeah. fragment with a number on it as well. These tiny little yeah. details start to come up. But then to the left, we've got this quite clear green stripe. And then above that, what feels like almost a shrunken down version of one of your larger paintings, if you know what I mean. And then mm -hmm. I'm starting to wonder, is that tiny fragment above the green, is that its actual size or is that uh, a digital scan that you've shrunken down? Yeah. How, uh, how has that come to be there? Yeah, that's exactly right. Basically the, the green, uh, the green color you see there, that's, uh, that's digital paint mm. on, on the background. And then, the uh, piece above that, that's a uh, scanned, I think it's plastic from when I worked on the floor, uh, basically a piece of plastic uh, that I used to cover the floors. Uh, not that like it, my floors need any covering because they're dirty as it is. <laughs> right, yeah. um, but, but like lots of, I thought it looked kind of cool when I held it up towards the light and then I thought, like, I'll, I'll just scan it and see. I scanned a few of those and they all turned out pretty pretty cool i thought so i was mm. just like you know like trying trying to fit it into somewhere and then here it here it ended up i guess it's so interesting because that scale shift for me is something i love and i think that's quite quite unique to digital abstraction particularly with what people are exploring at the moment in that I could be looking at something actually very small and intimate, like a fragment of paper that I can mm. get a sense of its size from the, the way I've handled magazines in the past or, you know, what uh, we'll come to the other side in a minute where there seems to be like pages from a book cover. But mm. then a scan of something much larger, then reduced down to something smaller to make it seem like it's a fragment, the yeah. scale shifts and the play with what's real what's large what's small what's big starts to get really interesting i think mm. yeah let's move across to the other corner here so just to give us a direction of where we are we've been to the bottom left i'm going to go to the bottom right now and the reason i'm doing this by the way is that um in terms of slow looking one really good way of approaching an artwork is literally just take, going from the bottom left to the top right and the bottom right to top left, if it's a painting that is, you know, or, or something uh, flat. Um, that just is a really simple way of uh, engaging with an artwork in total. Because sometimes I think a lot of us come to art, especially if it's something quite involved like this piece. And we're kind of, it was similar to the, to the scrolling thing about trying to consume everything I was saying earlier we try and do it with the art we try and sort of see everything at the same time which is obviously not how an artwork works and also i don't think how an artist really wants you to look particularly a painting and particularly an abstract piece where there's little moments happening there's different conversations that your eye is being led around so there's no need to try and consume it all in one go so let's go back to that bottom right corner it felt like this was starting to happen again here in this bottom right, these marks to me, mm. like they can't be that small is what I started to think. Like that's that would mm. be absolutely minute level of like line to have made. So I'm starting to think, oh, is this another scan piece as well? And these little fragments of details, I think, are really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'd love to just hear while we're sort of in this bottom corner, 
this digital process for you of going from finding fragments in the studio, starting to bring them, collage them together, then scanning a fragment and bringing that into the piece, the scanning process, does that change the way you then engage with a fragment? Obviously, you can change its size, which is what we're talking about. Mm. You could take something that was massive, like a photograph of something huge or a scan of a thing that was a lot bigger, make it a lot smaller, suddenly compose it in a way you wouldn't be able to before. Yeah. But yeah, does it change the way you view the fragments that you worked with? Does it sort of give you another level of ability in a way to work coming into a digital space with it? Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, the, I, you've already touched upon it, but I think there's this sort of sense of depth that you can mm. uh, create with uh, uh, with this technique, which is, I wouldn't say, but like basically impossible to do in, on a large scale piece. <laughs> right, yeah. You know, um, obviously I could go the, go the other way and scan something, print it out, and then attach it to a, a physical painting right, too. That could, right. that, that could work. But I think in this case, it's, it allows me to move faster, obviously. And, mm. uh, you know, like try out where it could potentially fit and, um, uh, and what it does to how it affects the, the, the surrounding or like the, the original sort of, piece that I had um, captured. So I did that. I think like the three or four, just need to remind myself. I know that these marks here that you see the, the sort of like the bluish sort of uh, yeah. black ones, they are definitely, they're scans um, mm. that I have shrunken down. They're quite large actually. And I think it's I when I was trying out um, a leather dye, I have a few of those, which sort of like seeps into the fabric. So you, you could see that there. So it's, it's two different shades of blue. Yes, right. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, because so, my mind, obviously, I read them as like almost like a letter, like marks on, on the page. Yeah. And then they were too, too intimate, too small for that. Yeah. Now thinking of them of like larger gestures made out of stains completely yes. makes me reread the marks, which is quite interesting. Um, yeah, I think the whole question of scale anyway in digital mm -hmm. art is really interesting. I think a lot of abstract art is working in this digital space, whether it's hybrid work like this or purely digital, although nothing is purely digital, is it? But that's another conversation. Um, mm -hmm. but uh do have this sort of wrestle with scale or there's there's a playfulness as well in that obviously when abstraction moved from let's say kandinsky then through to uh, russian constructivism we started to see the idea as the 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 canvas itself as an object as part yeah. of the composition where the edge of the canvas is becomes part of what the piece is um, and that's moved through right, right the way through to contemporary abstraction. Now it's, it's such an important consideration. How high is the piece hung? How big is it? And obviously you deal mm. with that sort of thing in your studio all the time. Um, with digital abstraction, scale kind of goes out the window. Um, mm. it's it, it, a piece and I, I was writing about this recently on my Substack page, um, I did an essay on figures and ground figure and ground relationships and scale is uh, th there is no fixed scale to a digital artwork. Right. Yeah. Even though this piece itself kind of gives a sense that there is a scale to it by having mm -hmm. stuff that we recognize. Actually, it's playing with your expectation the whole time. It's only as mm -hmm. big as the screen you're looking at it on, isn't it? Or the, or wherever you've printed it. So that's quite interesting yeah. as well. That's probably another whole uh, another whole episode talking about scale. Um, let's maybe move. Yeah, what have we got left? This and this. Um, just conscious of the time as well. So maybe let's do another two minutes discussion, then we'll hand over to the audience. So yeah, if you've got any questions, sort of right now, even just um, observations doesn't have to be a direct question. Um, just pop them in the comments now, and then I'll start bringing them up uh, in a few minutes. Um, yeah, I was I'm really interested in this section where 
the um well, let's bring it back to the whole where you have these two uh almost like book insert pages i guess uh back and front which give a sense of yeah as like i said the handheld the intimate but then but then everything's shifting so we're not quite sure um in terms of uh the actual composition of the whole piece um when you're working is it quite intuitive for you for for me the placement of those two things seem so essential like if i blocked them out with my hand you, you you could do this at home if you want you could block those two sections out with your hand those two book pages the whole composition completely altered yeah. that they seem so vital to the structure so yeah were, were they a starting point did things sort of intuitively build from them do, do you even remember i guess is a question yeah, yeah i kind of remember this one um but yeah no it's i i try to work fast when i'm when i'm in it and uh, you know i try not to think too much about uh, where to put things i i usually have a general idea and especially if you're working with materials that you only have one of it's like these pages if i would screw it up i would have to you know discard it again i guess yeah yeah um so obviously you have some sort of you, you try to be as uh quick but also effective as possible i guess that would be what i'm trying to do but then mm -hmm. you know like no i i i remember i wanted to have them not uh aligning with each other you know like side by side that i do remember and then obviously mm -hmm. i had worked on this sort of craft paper um material that i really do enjoy and i would you know like i highly recommend working on that because it's cheap it's quite durable and you know like I, I, it, you're not afraid of you know like messing it up if you're working on that That's whereas great. if you would go and get you know like some really expensive arches uh, uh paper for instance but no i mean like these those two were kind of the two first things after i've done the initial sort of like exploration just with a pencil and some uh dabs with the uh, oil paint and uh i think i even used um uh, enamel paint on this mm. um for the for the white textures oh that's or maybe i did that yeah 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 like it it's so like, like a lot and i guess here. classically enamel is used for yeah for sort of like um things that are going to be functional aren't they like coating that that kind yeah, of yeah like a bathtub or, or like a maybe boats and stuff yeah or, or even like um bowls i was thinking of as well which is mm -hmm. interesting to think back to the food reference as well yeah um, yeah yeah i think yeah coming back to that top just finally again i just love this is probably one of my favorite moments is you've got those two books sort of pages left and right and then you've got these two fragments of purple that seem so little mysterious friends and one is in the page and one is out the page. I just love that moment. I think that's such an important uh, moment to make this whole piece work. Yeah, it's mm. really. Um, yeah, if there's any questions, anyone wants to fire in, we've got sort of another five minutes left before um, we finish up. Um, oh, there's one coming through here. This is amazing, inspiring. Thanks, Tony. Oh, and for ask amazing questions. Oh, thank you, friend. Oh, that's from Doug Douglas. I really appreciate that. Um, oh, thanks. Well, thanks for being here. I'm glad you're finding it inspiring. And it's not just the Boring White Guy podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. Yeah. yeah. Excellent sound quality, though. That's Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that, Yeah, that's what makes it work, isn't it? Okay, here's a question come through. Natty has asked a question. <laughs> um tony big or small canvas is your preferred medium uh and why that's quite interesting um again i guess that brings it back to what i was saying earlier about this mm. feels quite different from the other work yeah right. why do um why do you explore sort of almost human sized canvases i mean uh bodily uh your size canvases regularly yeah yeah i think um i think once i tried doing it 
I just felt like, oh, I mean, like it, it, like you're you're able to, you know, like really work with it if if that makes sense. So I prefer not too big because too large. I have one that's right beside me. I can't really show it to you here, but it's I think that one is two ten by one eighty or one ninety, which is kind of like even too too large for for my taste to <laughs> to work on but uh, i mean like if you go up to like 140 by 170 120 by 160 these are kind of like the go-to sizes i think these pieces here are 140 by 170 and it's a, it's quite a, like it, it it like the impression that it can make when you when you experience it is different uh, that that's why I prefer to to work on it, and I kind of I kind of find it hard to work on smaller scale. I've tried to become better at that by um, frequently sketching uh, smaller sketchbooks. Um, you know, like try to get away from the from the sort of like thinking of the scale of it, but rather thinking of the um, uh, the canvas or the paper that you have in front of you and. Uh, make it work there. Obviously, then if you come into digital, uh, you have a whole other um, <laughs> dimension of it too. But yes, no. So I, I would like to answer the question. I would say um, big canvas would be my preferred uh, format. Uh, in in sort of like, I have a pretty. My canvases are usually in the size of uh, those that you see here, and then sometimes mm. going down to something that is more uh, you know like easier to ship <laughs> yes right yeah yeah thanks for that question nat uh we've got another one come through here as well from doug again tony do you find more comfort working on the floor than on the wall i guess you did mention that earlier with these pieces um do you find different creations come out of you as a result that's a really interesting question and let's go back to our piece while we're there. Yeah. So I think all of them have been on the floor initially. And I would say that it's easier for me to move around it and like or just going around it and um, moving it around. But eventually it goes up on the on the uh, on the wall and then another phase kicks in sort of. I guess mm. you could you see the details in a different uh, in a different way, if it should be, you know, like what, uh, how it should hang, like, uh, should it be this up this way or that way, or, you know, like, should it be, um, horizontally rather than, oh, you know, vertically yeah. aligned. Um, so when you're working on the floor, do you not, um, think initially of the orientation you're actually no, moving no. completely round the whole image? Oh, that's yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's the that's the that's the good thing about the about the floor, and I happen to have a lot of floor space, so it's just like it naturally becomes um, the best, I guess, area for me to work. Um, that's really interesting. Yeah, I never thought about that, uh, especially uh, with these pieces. Or we often see them, uh, yeah, as I say, just, just as a digital thing on the screen or as a shot of it hanging on the wall. Mm. Uh, sometimes obviously you send us, uh, show us some process photos on your feed and yeah. things like that. But, um, that's interesting to think that a painting might have been a completely other way around at some point, um, before mm. it settled on being there to me, they always seem to be so settled in, in the orientation they are, but at the same time, as you said, once it, gets on the wall a whole second set of concerns begins doesn't it yeah 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 for sure yeah yeah, yeah. well like the bigger I, I guess the the uh the the harder decisions are when it's on the wall you know like then you start to see if it if it even works i have a my friend and mentor he showed me a pretty cool technique that i really enjoy using from time to time when i see them on the wall and i have these uh like it's like um, a red glass, just like glasses, like proper Bono glasses, you know, like just like a red glasses. I guess they are sunglasses yeah. even. But when you when you put them on, you see it in a totally different way, and you start to see the the values rather, you know, like how much uh, how much dark versus light there is, 
um, wow. and uh, and all of that. So I can that, that's a, that's a technique I could definitely recommend to to that's try out. If you see it on the wall, sort of like flattening the image gets you to just see yeah. it for the forms. You're not distracted by the color relationships in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's really. And that's usually how yeah. how I determine if it should be up and down or if I need to add more to it. Right. Uh, yeah. It's like that old classic thing of looking at it in the mirror as well. Isn't exactly. It? Exactly. It's like it's that. yeah. It's more or less the same thing. Yeah. One thing I do quite often is um, uh, when I'm working digitally uh, through Photoshop is use uh, gradient maps. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, where you sort of apply a color throughout yeah. all the tonal values of the piece. Yeah. And that's that it's that same kind of thing, like you're saying, it allows you to suddenly see everything flattened um, yeah. in, a, in a strange digital way as it is. Yeah. Um, W74 says we need to conserve <laughs> food. So, yes, there's no book the anymore. So, <laughs> of, of episode one is conserve food. One <laughs> thought, I mean, one artist, one artwork, and the conservation of food. <laughs> yes, please, please do appreciate that well we're just over our 45 minute mark um tony it's been absolutely amazing thank you so much and taking us through this piece it's such a beautiful piece and the series is so beautiful as well as i said thank the you. piece will be available to purchase on collector the link is below this video or you can find it um on uh, on my tw on my Twitter feed and my uh, on my pinned as well, or through Tony's Twitter. Um, and am I right in saying it's six point nine soul? Is that? Is yeah, that I don't think I have listed it yet, but I was yeah I was thinking some somewhere around yeah. there, uh, plus some uh, the other ones are, are that price, aren't they? Anyway, yeah. it's around that price. If you're interested in the piece, please reach out to Tony. We're uh, with this series for, as I was saying, sort of encouraging, slow looking, the plan is that uh, we don't make this a kind of buy now, buy now thing. So, you know, at the end, if you're interested, Tony's uh, DMs will be open and you can chat with him and, and take it from there. Uh, but that's the general price point. Um, thank you so much to everyone who came today. We've had a bunch of viewers. Uh, it's been amazing. Um, let me just flick through here. Thanks again to Tony and um that's it for this episode um you can follow us on our handles here on twitter and you can follow collector and damzine as well if you want to see the full collection as it starts to grow on the collector website the link is in the description and it's also on the screen there collect.sh forward slash curations forward slash one art it's one artwork and join us again in two weeks time hopefully this will be a fortnightly stream i have quite a few artists booked up for the next uh, couple of months um and in two weeks time we're going to be joined by the amazing chepa tom um who makes digital abstract pieces by breaking down the code of videos which is a super interesting process so uh join us next time basically um and that's it from us Thank you every, very much, everyone. Thanks again, Tony. And um, we'll see you next time. Cheers.